Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. A uh, very warm welcome to the Impact Festival 2015, the future of the past, and especially warm welcome to uh, the fact that you are here on uh, the Friday night with us. Uh, you could be in bars checking out uh, new social life, but you're here with us uh, checking out digital social life uh, through the lens of the past as we do today on the Friday. Um, the future of the past, of course, explores memory in uh, a time of well, massive data capture, and as we all know, that digital age also came with a huge impetus to our online identities, and that's what this panel will be uh, about. Uh, we've invited some uh, interesting artists here today. Uh, Boris Meister from Geneva, Petter Janssen from Utrecht, and Digital Death Drive right behind me uh, from Amsterdam at the moment. And our moderator tonight is Natalie Dixon. Um, I'm very keen to... Um, tell a little bit about her before she starts and takes it away. Uh, Natalie Dixon is a passionate new media thinker and, um, and as a researcher she really loves the opportunities that the digital sphere um, has for both human and non-human expression. Um, she's underway currently with her PhD at Goldsmiths College London uh, investigating uh, amongst other things, mobile technology, um, and in her work in general, relationship between humans and technology is central, um, especially in her work for Affect Lab, and as such, she researches the love, the panic, and the effect that people share with technology. And I'm very welcome, uh, very happy to welcome you here, Natalie, to me moderating this panel. Thank you. Thanks, Ilke, and thanks everyone for coming, especially our speakers tonight. And we're going to hear about death, so Friday night and death it is. But uh, perhaps more accurately, it's the idea of life after death online. And what we might find is that digital death has some very interesting and complex friends, as we'll hear tonight, I'm sure. And these include things like the self, identity, the internet, and networks. So death and the internet is really not a, a new relationship or a new theme. We've been grappling with this for quite some time already. If I think back to 2009 and the web 2.0 suicide machine, some of you might have purged yourselves of your online profiles with the help of this site and left Facebook and Twitter. It ended many relationships for some of us. However, the topic is still relevant as much as it was then as it is now, and it is perfect for the theme of impact tonight. Uh, the theme this year, uh, we will be looking at the somewhat unimaginable future of our online selves after death. So to unpack these concepts, uh, we've already just said hi to our speakers, but I'll quickly run through them again. First up, we'll have Emily West and Stefan Schaefer, who present uh, their collaboration, Digital Death, Drive, and this is a multi-site, multi-event art and design collaboration concerned with digital death and the post-mortem self. So, very exciting. After Emily and Stefan, we'll have designer and curator Boris Meister. He'll present his work Above the Cloud, and I had the chance to see it just before we started. It is an extremely atmospheric and exquisite print project, which is centered on digital presence after death. And finally, we will hear from artistic researcher Paddy Janssen, who will present her work on collective memory. So we'll take uh, questions, uh, maybe one or two questions after each of the talks, but if you don't mind, we'll, and I'd like to suggest that we keep the bulk of the questions till afterwards. You will also have noticed that media artist Annie Berman was on the lineup for tonight. Uh, sadly, she couldn't be with us, but she is kind of with us on live streaming, so we just want to say hi to Annie. And uh, her video, which is called Utopia 1.0 Post-Neo-Futurist Capitalism in 3D, will be screened after the Q&A. So please stick around if you would like to see the film. Thank you, Annie. So to get on to our first speakers tonight, Emily West is a researcher and a writer with a background in end-of-life medicine and the dying process. So this includes working in the first hospice in Romania, as well as collaborating with the Wellcome Trust in London on various exhibitions centered on the theme of death. 
And Stefan Schaefer is an Amsterdam-based designer and researcher. He's currently investigating the relationship between physical absence and virtual presence. And together, Emily and Stefan present, or have presented the digital death drive, its very first symposium in April this year. Um, they've collaborated with the Wach Society, and the very next exciting iteration of your project, or your collaboration rather, is the publication that is due out fairly soon. So without further ado, Emily, Stefan, the floor is yours. So the church in its cemetery was traditionally the centre of a community and this meant that when people died they had this social insurance that meant that they would still feature in community life even after their death. Changes in networks and families mean that this traditional physical cemetery model is beginning to outgrow its use and with families and social contacts now often geographically disparate, a single resting place for the remainder of eternity is an untenable prospect for future visitors to the deceased. With this increase of um, geographical mobility in our lives, um, this coincided with the widespread adoption of the internet as a new means of sharing spaces and communities. And the 1990s saw a large take-up of services that allowed the construction of user-built websites. Um, and as the digital world developed, it provided a meeting place for geographically disparate families, friends and communities uh, to gain a means of reclaiming common space that isn't reliant on geographical proximity. And it's somewhat inevitable that as these pages documented births and family milestones grew in popularity, um, they became community and family focal points that then began to record death and play a part in the memorialization and grieving process. GeoCities in particular became a hub of user-generated memorials. It's now possible to download the cache of the entirety of GeoCities and locate things through key sentences and phrases. Um, so this is from a piece of code that we wrote that um, searched everything through on in loving memory. So you get a huge variety of websites that people made as these memorial pages. Um, but they're quite interesting demographically. Uh, the key demographic making these pages seem to be bereaved parents and mostly mothers. And there's a very particular aesthetic throughout these pages that you can see some of on the, on the slide here. And surprisingly few changes between the sites. And they also often give quite a particular representation of, of the descendant um, and the continuing social impact and the continuing way that they go on to live online is through their mother's eyes, which is quite an unnerving prospect for most of us probably. Um, they decide what the dead person will signify and how they will be represented. Um, and this is one of the first things that was interesting in terms of construction of self after death. We used to have this very formalised and standardised uh, graveyard memorialisation. And this is where it begins to become more individualised and um, things other than the very basic facts about the person who's died are represented in memorialization that's publicly accessible. The shift from physical to digital networks has necessitated a shift in terms of relationships and mourning. Mourning as a social act uh, generally represents the or echoes the relationship's own structure. Um, so things like this grave, um, gravestone and um, mourning uh, websites are quite often seen as inappropriate or um, too informal, especially by older generations. But if your relationship or your life was lived largely online using these kind of structures within life, this may well be the truest echo and the, the truest representation of yourself in death. Um, this, this also echoes social death in the real world, the concept of being removed from one's social realm through either illness or incarceration as a preliminary and liminal form of death. And in the same way that a physical graveyard places the dead within a town or village community, digital spaces of grief contextualize the dead within the networks and forms that they were known in life. 
Um, a key issue in life continuing online has been the way that the dead may continue participating in networks and the effect that this can have on the living and still affect and shape um, relationships. So this can be in the form of an identity such as Facebook or Twitter that was set up prior to death or a newly adopted identity through the site or through, sorry, a specific service site or um, as a corpse. Uh, so there have been numerous cases of network lives of corpses becoming problematic for family and friends who are left behind. And this has led to more fundamental questions that concern the nature of respect and reverence surrounding the idea of personhood and the body, whether the body in question is dead or alive. A bill has been introduced in certain US states that would make photographing a corpse a misdemeanor offense uh, other than for certain legitimate purposes, usually um, for lawmaking. And this is um, one of the first things that gives a dead person fundamentally different image rights and regulations to a living person. So it really concentrates on that very moment of death and there within the law, your, your rights and your specifications as a person changes. Um, and while legislation and codes of conduct like this have always existed, the development of technology that allows sharing with a wide and often anonymous audience quickly has changed the implications of such photographs taken and shared by officials and passers-by. And a lot of this came about due to one case in particular, which I am not showing a photograph of. Um, a girl called Nikki Katsouris, who died in California. And she died in a very high-impact car chase um, and was very, very severely injured, almost decapitated. Um, and uh, the first responders on scene took photographs of the accident scene and shared these uh, via email, um, and the images kept on coming back to the family, uh, often hidden in emails that were supposed to be about work or posted through their door and caused a lot of upset. Um, and I'm just going to read straight from the page, unfortunately, um, part of this legislation because I think it's particularly interesting. The court decided that the details about the destined corpse revealed in the accident scene photographs did not pertain solely to the decedent or to privacy interests that expired with her. Details concerning a corpse are unlike private facts of any other kind because of the survivor's responsibility to inter the decedent's body. Society recognises the emotional and familial bonds underpinning survivors' direct interest in their deceased's body by conferring on them the right and obligation to dispose of the body. But the medium in which the defendant chose to make the disclosure is important, since email is so susceptible to easy and thoughtless forwarding to a larger audience. So it is the crux of um, the change in legislation and legislation that's been in place for hundreds of years is based around um, the fact that death and dead bodies, corpses, can now go on to have um, whole new networked lives. But of course, every negative has a positive. Um, curated online personas may be beneficial to keep alive after the physical death of the individual. And the number of public figures now who utilise social networks as a source of revenue in return for prominently sponsored products and advertisements has raised questions on whether the physical death still needs to signal the end of lucrative commercial relationships. Um, Joan Rivers, uh, because she died fairly unexpectedly, um, still had all these automated tweets and postings and things set up and endorsed the newest iPhone almost a week after she died. And her Twitter account still uh, posts every week Throwback Thursday photos uh, of highlights from her career. So Joan doesn't need to be alive. Her Twitter account um, still carries on as it would. Um, which brings us to question whether some digital lives are now too valuable to stop when hearts stop beating. Does the death of the body need to signal the end of an active online life? Our digital cells have the potential to die discrete deaths long before or after our bodies cease to be. And this calls for us to explore possibilities for the dead outside of burial or being made simulacra of the living. 
We need a new language and a new structure so that we can concentrate on the future without necessarily being tied to the past. And similarly, this may call for new signals of absolute death, both digital and physical. You should be able to mark when you are truly dead and do not wish to carry on at all. Um, but what is currently clear is that our models of signalling death and memorialisation are, are no longer sufficient for the multiples of liminalities of death that are now possible living digitally and physically. In, the Western, in Western culture, photographs of people during their lifetime have always played a significant role in the period of bereavement following their death. Before the invention and especially spreading of photography in the mid-1800s, memorabilia of the deceased took the shape of paintings, uh, drawings, sculptures, death masks, um, and more, which depicted the subject as living to preserve the deceased and keep her or him in memory uh, in the case of death. The pre-mortem photograph differs um, in the anticipation of oncoming death from a normal portrait uh, to secure the shadow ere the substance fades. Or as a photographer from back then, uh, the 18, 1850s was advertising it, uh, it offers portraits of father, mother, sister and brother which you can look upon with pleasure when the grave covers the original. Pre-mortem photographs were converted into memorial portraits, uh, which found place on diverse media, varying from life-size prints um, or a carte de visite, which is just yeah, a small card in the, uh, the size of a business card, um, a small print on thin paper attached to a slightly uh, thicker paper. On these cards, it was common to have the name of the deceased and the date of birth and death, accompanied with a short text from the Bible or a few lines of conventional verse. The service of memorial photographs following a death grew and opened the door for the exchange and circulation of images. The bereaved would receive sheets of the photographs and could order copies to send to family and friends. In exchange for this, they would and could receive photos of the deceased taken by friends while the guys were still alive. And representations of the deceased were so circulating within um, a group of, uh, of the bereaved, an exchange and circulation of memorial photographs created so a kind of mourning group around them, a community. So in the later mid-1850s, it was possible to, um, to have glass negatives so you can um, could save something and ask a, a copy back when you needed a copy later. You could just ask it back. And commonly, there was a slogan of a carte visite. Backside um, became, copies can always be had. Thus, representation of the deceased in form of a photograph, be it pre or post mortem, uh, were stored in physical image banks and callable at any time by the photographer. This was still the 1800s. Nowadays, this whole thing is still happening a lot um, and getting a bit more uh, pimped up, uh, especially in South America. Uh, nowadays, images are digital, floating through a digital uncertainty. Names became profile names, and conventional verses are replaced by hashtags and more. Still always available, but the photographer to ask turned into a Wi-Fi connection, and slogans like copies can always be had is now drag and drop. A card to visit is replaced with a digital device. The color fading of the physical photo and the decreasing quality of ordering a copy of today lies in image compression. They are stored in memory. Um, so what used to happen is there was a death notice and the family was always the inner circle. You might hear about the death if you lived in the same village or read about it in the newspaper. What happens now is that information is instant. Everybody gets the information and misinformation at the same time. And the misinformation example for a death is, um, I think most of you remember the death of uh, actor Robin Williams, and on Twitter it was quite a big thing, but some guys wrote uh, the singer's name Robbie Williams. So Robbie Williams kind of died digitally in an accident because they were just misspelling this name. So he, but he already had a memorial group then. Um, <clears throat> So it was then created for someone that was actually still alive, physically. Um, the shift to social media means that often, certainly with the younger generation, the friends are now the inner circle of mourning groups, rather than family and especially the elder ones. 
Facebook is where many young people live, so if a memorial site is set up, the grandparents and possibly parents may not be on Facebook, so the family becomes disenfranchised. With, with griefing online comes the issue of closure. According to Damien McKellick, PhD candidate, School of Law, uh, University of Ireland, is what social media gives with one hand, it takes with the other. She says, explaining that while it provides a place <coughs> for people, <coughs> sorry, um, a place for people to grieve through stories and conversation, much like what happened at the wake. It is indefinite, 24 seven access, so closure is not as clearly defined. If you could constantly be flooded with images of the deceased person, it brings, it, it brings things back to how it was rather than allowing it to move forward. So it's just a digital nature that you still, um, there's not really a closure of the deceased person. This is the difference from these old school images and now. Um, this is now all Facebook based or more third, uh, third parties or networks. Um, but I will come, to this, uh, come back to this later. Um, death in the network. <clears throat> Third party services, pro service providers and networks are creators of post-mortem identities that are not created, what Emily said, they were made by uh, mothers or family members or friends in the, met the website, but now Facebook has way more power as another level that the company also creates your uh, identity and also your post-mortem identity then. And it's just Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Dropbox, Google, World of Warcraft or anything else where you create an account for yourself. By, uh, for yourself. Um, but also, they don't really have a death-related intention. So they just do it, and it's made for the living. But if they die, it's still the trouble. How do you delete an account? And Facebook had the several issues about it. Um, and this year, the terms of conditions changed several times already to make it easier and faster to delete an account of someone deceased. <clears throat> um, the first change included a specific re request, a form, to delete the account of a deceased person. The last point in that form required to upload a proof of the person's death, not necessarily a death certificate, but just an, uh, an obituary, it was fine. And this was mentioned as optional, so it was not really obliged that you really have to send this thing. And in the case of Rusty Foster, this led to an accidental Facebook death in 2013. His account got deleted and as he was declared dead to Facebook, dead to Facebook, but he just, um, at the same name, li uh, name, like another user who died in 2011, with someone uploading an obituary with the same name. Foster resurrected somehow a few days later on Facebook. But this leads to the idea that faking an obituary could be used as a strategy to kill people online on Facebook. As likes, posts, and any other behavior action on Facebook is designated as the truth by Facebook, used for personalized ads and collecting data and adding layers um, to our virtual identities, initiating one's own death on Facebook would disrupt the system. So a digital death can maybe be a use for something, how to disrupt the system. <coughs> um, so the second change just happened uh, now a few months ago, and I think they now changed it again, actually. Um, in the US, Facebook now requests a death certificate, but what is more interesting is that the digital death could work as a strategy to, preverse, to preserve your cyber and to disrupt the system. <coughs> I'm still here. Because after the end of a physical life, we still are stored in memory, our virtual identities become our virtual tombstones. Within a few years, there will be a huge virtual identity graveyard anyway, as for example, there are now 28 million users above 55 years old, but they're now still alive, but there's always a time when yeah, there's a limit. And if we think about how to live online, it's maybe time now to consider how to die or how to be dead online. Um, and what, about yeah, what the digital death can actually, what it can mean. Um, and as our online identities become virtual tombstones, they also offer some kind of opportunities. Um, and I'm still speaking about the existing networks like Facebook and Twitter. So a self-planned afterlife uh, by adjusting existing ne networks is, for example, the artist on Kavara, who has, um, when he was still alive, he made some daily paintings of the date, but he also sent out in the six late 60s, early 70s, some telegrams, just, uh, I'm still alive. And this somehow got made, I don't know if it was him, I think well, he was, uh, it was more uh, a <clears throat> homage to him. 
Um, but there's a Twitter bot that keeps every day tweeting, since he died, I'm still alive, hashtag art. And this is the only thing that this thing does. So somehow he is still there and he is still alive. And it's art. Um, I don't know where this would end, if, I, if I just, there's a, a lack of closure somehow. This is, it, maybe it serves as a transition. Somehow, if Twitter is going down, then um, maybe this is also over. Um, another thing is, um, that was really recently, that the YouTube star, 13-year-old Caleb Bretterly, he arranged, uh, he, I don't know how many followers he had now, I forgot the number, but he had a huge amount of followers, and he, a lot of fans, and then he, uh, he knew that he would die, so he also, he and his family, and I think also BBC was included, that there was really live stream on YouTube, live streaming and then showing on YouTube his whole uh, funeral and memorial and all these things that people can react on it. A few found it really disgusting, other, th other people said, okay, but he had this huge community, so why is this virtual uh, relation to them, why should it be less worthy than, than the digital ones that he already had? Because it was a few millions. Um, <clears throat> but also, we can maybe um, create a community by the application of hashtags, which give a direction of placement within a descriptive context that creates communities anyway, and what we do while we are still alive. According to some researchers, the community role of a hashtag presents in its functionalities to identify a community, to form a community, and allow users to join a community. This should be pre-planned because maybe when you're dead, it's hard to join this. As this is now a practice uh, where being alive, could this be adjusted to the dead? Communities created around hashtags concerning death might give a small opportunity for this. Users might plan their path to a digital afterlife guiding us to their destination as hashtag heaven, hashtag hell, hashtag paradise, Tartarus, oblivion, or earth. They might give a hint of what they, um, about they, they might give a hint of what they became, an angel, corpse, poltergeist, or hashtag totem, or let us know about their condition, hashtag dead, hashtag back on the map, hashtag unbound with data, or hashtag forever. By using hashtags as the gatekeeper for communities of the dead. <clears throat> but of course, people can also join it when they just have a hashtag and they're still alive, then of course they join the community. So it might be a nice meeting, meeting spot for um, dead and alive, a funeral visit. Um, third part, so this is something, till now was more how you could actually plan something, but then there are also, because Facebook is a third party provider, there are also a lot of services that provide something um, to, to plan your afterlife while you're still alive. Um, and one thing is Lives On is a Twitter-based service with the tagline, your social afterlife. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I don't know why this is funny, but somehow it, it, it's the, it nails it, yeah. Uh, your heart stops beating, you keep on tweeting, kind of. Online services such as Lives On provide us with algorithm-based afterlives by analyzing our social media behavior, in this case Twitter, what I would have, could have, and should have tweeted, retweeted, favored, and who I might have been followed, who I might have followed. Described as this could be an early version of the Matrix, Lives On's initiators, London-based advertisement company Lean Mean Fighting Machine, mention on their website that requests for the service we're already above 10,000 before the launch of the project. Tomorrow they launch a new one, and now I was finally one of the 10,000 that I could get in, so from now I can also look how this whole thing works. Um, okay. Um, so all these things, if we, we are still kind of always reliable on third, um, on third party service providers. But there are also ways, how can we do this uh, really by ourselves? And somehow, there are these Memoto cameras, maybe this would be one thing, if we take selfies and pictures of ourselves, not all of us, of course, but it's quite, it's quite hip. So why not install this kind of stuff in your coffin, for example, that you can still have some images all the time, they get uploaded and someone can have a look at it. I thought it was, was a quite a bizarre idea, but actually, it's, it's already in planning. It's a, it's a programmer called Roger Benberthy, a web developer from Falmouth, England, who will install a camera for a live stream in his coffin, running with solar cells on his tomb, and to share his process of decay to his family who can log in on the website iamdead.com, streaming while rotting. And he has actually a really nice idea about the death. He said, I have a very pragmatic approach to death. It's true, <laughs> Roger says, and I fear it 
I fear it not the slightest degree. The same cannot be said for my wife, who, who does nothing but cry when she thinks of me gone. Um, the thing is also, he, um, he does this in collaboration with the um, um, College of Medicine and Dentistry, that they can also have, get some research of, uh, of, of the forensic data of it. So you can serve really still a purpose while you're still rotting. And it's online. Um, so you have to look on the bright side. After all the skin from around my mouth disappears, it will look as if I'm getting happier and happier, which is actually a nice thing um, that you can think about it like this, until there's nothing left but a huge shit-eating grin. Um, and to leave messages in personalized domain suffixes, maybe in categories, because he is now on website, but it, as we already go closer and closer to personalized uh, suffixes of domain names, like if .berlin now and .tokyo and I don't know, so it gets smaller and smaller, why can't you just also personalize these things in the future? So this is a small selection that we thought could give a hint um, to this whole thing. And if I summarize or draw a rough conclusion of, of all these examples, it's more like a now piling, of course, some uh, examples that we have. Um, I think it's uh, a relevant aspect to think of a digital afterlife or a digital death, and there are plenty of opportunities to deal with it, be it rituals that shift from the physical to the virtual world, like the, the whole image, the post-mortem photography thing, new rituals based on online behavior. It can happen by adjusting existing networks, creating new ones, thinking about the shift from a closed morning group to an ever-growing one, where sometimes far friends come <clears throat> become close members. And do I want to share my rotting face as a smiling selfie with the world? And what kind of construction would I need then in my coffin? Thank you. That was it. Thanks, uh, Emily and Stefan. Do we have one question for the team? Is there a microphone? That... Thank you. Yes, I was really wondering um, what you have noticed, like um, to what extent the, ex uh, the acceptance um, or embrace or rejection of these things is shaped by culture. No, because um, uh, I know that, for example, in um, Latin American culture and, and, and like in the Caribbean, it's, it's um, much in a popular belief of, 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 uh, of death. Um, sort of this, what you described, that the closure never happens. So um, now it's almost the, the Dia de los Muertos in Mexico, and uh, people go to like the graves and they, they take food and like alcoholic beverages, and they really sort of share it and, and enjoy um, good experiences um, with the dead, like participating in it. And um, this is sort of a similar um, idea of, uh, you know, the, the, the dead actually in sort of a parallel world sort of still participating in the same things that humans do, which is um, opposite to um, the more Western idea shaped probably by Christianity, like the, you know, the fear of the judgment and, and um, the, the really sort of the, 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 the break between, you know, the here and the, and the, and the now, which um, um, pushes dead... Um, and uh, like that and, and death really away from everyday life. So I was wondering if you um, have experienced like cultural differences in the acceptation of um, this, this digital death uh, uh, initiative. You mean if we have the, because this thing what we're talking now was really based on the Western uh, models that we have. Um, so, and all the big companies are also Western. So I think there's a bit of the link, but yeah, of course, um, Oh, where was this again? Where they have every year, I mean, they keep corpses for years somehow, and they just let them participate once a year in a, in a celebration. But I think what the digital, what's the difference in the digital part is that it's still, then it's, um, it's a state of what it was. And with the digital one, it's just something that still goes on. There's so much new stuff coming on still around this identity. So I think this is a difference between, if this, was, if this answers your question. I think the shift to the digital in the West um, is also a shift more towards those types of funerary practices where you do keep yes. on interacting with the dead because now it's much more acceptable uh, friends True, yeah. on Facebook who died and people still wish them a happy birthday or they speak to them at Christmas or they speak exactly, to them on yeah. the anniversary of the death. So that's kind of precipitating a shift in, in how we deal with people who are dead rather than with death as such, I think. Okay. okay, so...
Thank you very much. We'll take other questions right at the end after everyone's talk. So if you have something else you want to ask, just hang five. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Boris Meister. And when I spoke to Boris earlier this week, he told me that he's been interested in archaeology even as a, as a kid, and especially in the underworld. And back then it was Egyptian archaeology, and now it's the archaeology of social networks. And he created, as I mentioned earlier, this very beautiful print publication called Above the Cloud, which is a research and design project that he created in 2012. And it takes the reader on a journey through the digital afterlife. The project came, I think, at a very interesting time when we were still debating as designers and researchers the so-called divide between the real and the virtual, which I think many have deemed to be meaningless. So please join me in welcoming Boris. Um, thanks, Natalie. Uh, I feel a bit like the only idiot who brings a book to um, kind of a technology symposium. And also, uh, before starting, uh, I'd like to, to address you a little disclaimer uh, that I'm in no way an academic nor a journalist, and uh, I'm just a designer with some interest into research and speculative projects. Uh, the numbers and facts that will be presented tonight are in no way um, accurate. I will not take them as guaranteed at all. Uh, because as well, this project was made in, 2000, uh, in 2012, uh, and things have evolved very quickly uh, up, uh, until today. Um, so they are here just as illustration and to give a sense of scale. Uh, there is nothing factual and only allegories. Uh, yeah, I thought it was important. Um, so in the 90s, Britpop band Oasis' song, uh, song Life Forever was written by band member Noel Gallagher in 1991, shortly after his foot was crushed by a pipe while walking. With more time on his hands, he was able to focus on song lyrics. This is how it ends. We're gonna live forever, gonna live forever, live forever, forever. After he finished it, he showed it his, uh, to his younger brother Liam, who was so pleased that he asked Noel to join the band Oasis. Like most era-defining pop song, Oasis Live for Life Forever has become a fixture of the collective pop culture conscience. Uh, conscience. On social network, normal humans who are not pop culture celebrities or pseudo uh, celebrities exist, update their profile, have an audience uh, comprised of friends and followers, and broadcast everything from articles to random thoughts blurbs. So when, uh, when someone dies on social networks, do the world celebrate them? Do they become a zombie, or do they just live on the collective social media conscience? And more importantly, do they live forever? So, um, in 2010, I read this article stating that there will be around 3 million page, uh, profile pages belong to, belonging to that user left unattended on Facebook. I was interested uh, in this, uh, like just by the curiosity of this fact, uh, but what triggered my interest was mostly the analogies I could draw between the web imagery and naming with in real life situation in topics like uh, urbanism, sociology, and identity. Uh, I made this book as my diploma project uh, for, uh, it was a graphic design project for, uh, for this school named ECAL in Lausanne in Switzerland. It's a, 20, uh, it's a 250 pages uh, atlas, it takes the form at, uh, of an atlas uh, in the broader uh, sense um, because I considered uh, this digital space as a, um, yeah, uh, appropriately as a space uh, where I could draw maps um, take out some facts and figures, and as well uh, generate imagery around that. So also Atlas in the terms of, uh, of the mnemosyme from uh, Abby Weiburg, uh, which is also just a mapping of ID of um, art history references put together and uh, just uh, generating a new, uh, a new sense and a new meaning. So I will start with presenting you some uh, Quick facts. Um, 
So nowadays, I updated this very quickly. Um, uh, so in 2015, around 20% of the world population has a Facebook account, um, which is uh, almost half a billion, uh, a billion and a half active user on a monthly basis. Um, Facebook collects tons of information, which are pictures people upload, status updates, uh, and likes and interconnection between users and content. Um, in 20, I think it was in 2011 that, um, yeah, in 2011, um, just the mass of information that was uploaded in their servers uh, would amount the, the double of every um, every written work produced by all uh, the humankind in all different languages. That's a bit of an abstract um, value, but it just sums it all uh, in terms of the, the engagement people had for, for this uh, website. Also, uh, some 10,000 Facebook users will die every day. Uh, this statistic is drawn from um, World Health organizations, uh, depending on the demographics and the death rate through, uh, f uh, uh, through different countries. And um, I know that in uh, the in 20 uh, in 2012. We came up, we, uh, I read the number of 6 million dead user, uh, user um, with still an open profile on Facebook. And the number has increasingly um, evolved. Uh, and today it's about one out of 30 Facebook accounts that will belong to uh, a deceased person. So I'll let you do the math. Uh, I haven't <laughs> it will be like a, a huge uh, number to pronounce. Uh, and I will not be sure with my shaky English, but um, so um, the book was divided into uh, three main parts, which are the ghost, uh, the memory, and the runes. And it starts with some kind of a glossary um, that is uh, mostly image associations and definitions that I'm going to really quickly go through. Um, it's some kind of ethereal, uh, atmospheric, um, and engaging, like it, it's just an introduction to the subject. Um, so, from the mausoleum to the data center, the motherboard of any computer to the speculative architecture of, Arch uh, of ArchiZoom. Blue is the color of the social web, the color of the sky where the cloud is, and the, uh, where the cloud is, and the color of the screen of death. Blue sky stands to be considered times where the emotions are more easily expressed. We upload to the cloud. Um, yeah, we, uplo uh, we upload to the cloud. It is a terrible, unforgetting, and unforgivable unforgi world brain. We upload our selfies, right or, uh, on someone else's wall, expose our friendship network, uh, our friendship network to our current activities, moods, and emotions. Uh, with all this personal content we share or that we interact with, we create a digital avatar or extension of ourselves, and sometimes even a more sincere image of ourselves exists on the internet. As the simulation overpassed the reality, it has become so hard to draw a line between IRL identity and a virtual one. I like to think they are, in a, they are really much the same and unique persona. Those are images from um, Welt am Draht from Fassbinder. It was a telefilm, I think from the 70s. Uh, it's kind of um, pre-matrix, totally uh, Baudrillard uh, in the idea of um, this own network and who is, who, who, uh, who is the watcher, who is the system, uh, who haunts this. So the first part of the book, uh, The Ghost. When I made this project in 2012, the situation was slightly different. Facebook dem demographic was still very young and mostly used by people in the 20s or 30s. And, ch and chances were that your parents never locked in. I still feel lucky that actually like none of my relatives uh, at friend requested me so far. And, uh, 
At the time as well, uh, there wasn't any kind of legacy uh, contact form to fill, which was um, very recently introduced by Facebook and um, slightly before, I think it was in 2013, that uh, um, Google organized this. Um, so it's basically just to uh, transfer the ownership of your account to um, a trusted relative or friend in case uh, you die. Um, so there wasn't it at all at the time, and to s get someone out of Facebook um, was pretty complicated. Relatives, at, uh, just as mentioned before, relatives had to send like a death certificate to someone they will they never spoke with, which is not an official, but just a um, Facebook operator. Um, uh, we will later decide to suspend or delete the account. Um, and for people who got once their uh, Facebook profile uh, shut down or just for like using a fake name or uploading um, the bad content on it, you will know that it's very, very, very user friendly and no, it's a struggle to uh, get it back. So. Uh, there is um, this digital divide that was happening uh, coupled with some internet illiteracy that is also a big thing in, the, um, in this issue. Uh, and there are times um, due to the loss of uh, someone dear uh, that create this strange situation where profiles would begin to uh, wander around uh, where like profile belonging to dead people will begin to, to wander uh, around the social network. Facebook, thirsty of interaction, will then simul uh, stimulate, the, uh, stimulate them with, for example, reminders to wish someone else happy birthday, uh, which is some kind of, um, kind of, it is uh, a weird reminder of, um, yeah, um, or weird comeback from someone you thought you 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 lost, and it somehow pops up with a red uh, icon and tells you, "Hey, you haven't talked for a while to John Doe, for example." Um, and as long as we can say uh, human civilization are always separated um, itself from um, the, the dead ones. So it created this kind of um, new paradigm um, that we were actually uh, witnessing with the Facebook, uh, yeah, with this Facebook issue. Uh, we will see ghosts uh, freed from human control send notification to interact uh, with us. It's like a spooky poke in a way. Um, Then comes, uh, I put these two chapters into uh, only one for this lecture, is the memory and the runes. Um, so it's about what happens when someone passes away, leaving an uh, open profile in a technical sense. There was uh, Jed Brubaker, which uh, I have to give a shout out to, uh, he's an American sociologist who was maybe from, what I've seen the first one to, to write uh, in an academic way uh, on these issues. Uh, I owe him a lot uh, for helping me and letting me use uh, his uh, researches. Um, he studied the behavior interaction uh, of people grieving the loss of a contact. So obviously, um, in the first week, people will use it as a mausoleum uh, as a place uh, to grieve, um, sharing kind, uh, kind thoughts, supportive message, and memories. So this is the very dramatic case. It actually happened. This um, American, uh, maybe teenager, uh, because they drive earlier, just uh, Facebooking and driving at the same time, and that was her last tattoo uh, update. Uh, it's. Maybe, I don't know, I'm just supposing that she might be one of uh, the first dead due to Facebook, uh, the first casualty. Uh, as they say, um, 
So people, like, that's the kind of uh, day one or day zero of uh, the happening. Um, when then the rumor spreads, uh, people gather, uh, grieve, share these uh, messages, uh, supportive messages, most of them. Um, and uh, after a while, the place become um, vac vacant because, uh, of course, after, um, I mean, it goes through all this kind of uh, grief cycle, the, the Kubler-Gross uh, grieving um, scheme. Um, people for, tend to forget, which is important as well in um, kind of the human um, construction. Uh, we have to let go uh, people we, we lost. Uh, so um, as a physical, uh, and that's where I go to kind of the runes, um, in the physical space, uh, that will be uh, a place only defined by a few megabytes uh, that someone else built uploading his content, and after a while, this place become um, vacant and forgotten. Uh, spammy content might take this, uh, make it way, uh, make, uh, sorry, I'm just going a bit forward uh, just to be relevant with what I'm saying. Um, so spammy content might make it way through, like weird graffiti on the walls of a piece of wasteland. Um, I don't know if you ever had this kind of, uh, it's not Facebook, but if you had this kind of old embarrassing like Yahoo address you made when you were 14 and after a while you just totally forget it um, and after a while it just happens that, yeah, it has been cracked, uh, someone gets possession of it and start like spamming of writing to your family asking for money. So it, it just start like, yeah, if we consider spam as weed, uh, or bad weed, uh, yeah, that's just kind of nature or like takes possession uh, from what it owns. Um, yeah, sometimes we, uh, people will still occasionally write something on birthday, for example, uh, but this, uh, yeah, is still invaded by junk. Uh, I think I've been talking very, very quickly. How, uh, how is it with time? I still have time. Okay, perfect. So yeah, as a conclusion, um, I also like with the advent of big data and which is of course uh, what Facebook look, is looking for, it's human activity uh, going through filters uh, and then analyze. So the human existence gets more and more defined by the information someone generates online. I don't think someone that's on a Facebook by turning her or his page to memorial mode could just help that analyst to shape their predictions. Uh, there is commerce to be made out of any situation. Milk it. Always active, always a source of data, mine, uh, of data to mine, there is definitely little rest for the data proletarian that we have become. So that was just to end. <laughs>
That's true, but it's not because of my bad presentation skills, but because collective memory networks uh, tend to have very bad quality. Um, two and a half years ago, I was inspired by the work of Hans-Peter Feldman called 912 Front Page. In this work, Feldman questions how Im images of traumatic events as presented to us by the media work into our collective memory of these events. This led me to my research called The Private, The Public and The Nation, which concentrated on how media communicates death to us based on, it, on its tactics and typography. Already back then, it occurred to me that collective memory, as presented on the web, takes on a complex form. A collective memory is a fluid concept. Collective memory, in terms of my research, relates to our national, national or community identity. In the words of profession journalism, uh, Carolyn Kitch, unfortunately not my words, we are in need of a narrative that binds us, a togetherness, the feeling that we are not alone in this. This group identity can survive and evolve over time, meaning content-wise it can and will change. It needs production and performance, since we cannot actually possess this moment in history we try to remember. We need to mediate to remember. Now, this is where Pierre, Pierre Nora's concept of les lieux de mémoire comes to mind, the places of memory. Places that are meant to prevent the loss of memory and in this way stand apart from history because they are capable to change over time and are open to meaning. On collective memory, we distinct between official memory and vernacular memory. Official memory, memory is the most familiar to us. The collective memory is presented to us by institutions and museums. Vernacular memory, memory, on the other hand, is almost literally the voice of the people. You could say the individual experience of a collective memory. Now the web has shown to be open to combinations of official and vernacular memory, such, such as for example the German online magazine Spiegel, you see on the left, where online users can submit articles on German history. And on the left, Time magazine's portraits of resilience, where survivors, family members, US officials and the former president tell their personal stories of 9-11 on video. However, more and more uh, users circulate and share their own creations of a certain collective memory online. On the web and through digital interfaces, a memory is generated which moves back and forth between past, present and future. It shapes a complex memory where in the shaping of this memory, we lose memory by deleting, uploading, producing and reproducing over and over again. And at the same time, we gain a collective memory in the form of these processes and the relations they render. I'm quoting media theorist and philosopher Wolfgang Ernst. The web provides immediate feedback, turning all present data into archival entries and archival entries into data a dynamic agency with no delay between memory and the present. Archive and memory become metaphorical, a function of transfer processes, which Ernst describes as an economy of circulation, permanent transformations and updating. As the concept of mem collective memory is in flux, networks are constantly in flux, they do not fall silent. The web has no memory, it does not store, it is always on the move. Geert Lovink already stresses this point in Networks for a Cause. How are we to understand all of this information when its context is always in transition? And as I might add myself, how are we able to understand one changing concept in another ever-changing concept? There are no places of memory, Ernst states. There are simply URLs. In other words, digital memory is built from its architecture. It's embedded in the network and constituted from how it links from one to another. 
and she explains the idea of a digital museum and archive as non-places. Now from places we go to non-places. And I would prefer to describe these non-places of memory rather as processes of memory. A generative memory with its meaning collective and mediation always on the move. Network collective memory does not concern places. It concerns time. What is created is a collective monument spread along URLs, always open to additions and interaction, and where the actual mediation, the actual collective memory, lies in the repetition and sharing of this mediation. A digital collective Leo de memoir. Obviously, we need a new term. The image is shared and picked up by the collective, and while it is picked up, a little bit of the user is rendered into these images and sent along the web. The image, in this sense, is always in transition and refers back to the collective of its creation. We add statements to keep the memory close, to invoke it. We will never forget. We will always remember. We try to ensure ourselves that we still possess this memory we try to keep near. We pray over blue skies until we pray over the universe while we honor our heroes. And now I will show you my artistic work. Lights, please. Two. Nine. Eight. Five. 2,985 people died on September 11, 2001. Ten years ago. Ten years ago. Ten years ago, we witnessed America's pride crumble. We watched. We watched one plane. And a second plane. And a third. Crashed into the Twin Towers in the Pentagon. 2,985. 2,985 lives taken. Ten years later. We stand strong. Honoring the accountants, the businessmen, the firefighters, the policemen, and the rest of the thousands of innocent people whose lives were suddenly taken on the streets of New York City that day. September 11, 2001. Remember. Remember that day, because our country, our country, our country, stands united as one.
Anybody have any questions? Sure. Just over here. We can hear you. It's okay. Go ahead. Experience with uh, personally dealing with the aftermath of a friend or loved one's online uh, presence. Or did you feel responsible in any way? I was wondering if there is there personal interest behind this in any way. I, I, obviously, I don't mean in your personal life, but whatever you share. Um, actually, my father died at the beginning of this year and is still alive on Facebook. Um, and with doing what I do, both medically and theoretically, I never expected that to be the case. I started working on this subject uh, before he died. Um, but I always thought that I'd do something more deliberate. Uh, but when it came to it, I haven't. So it's, it's been quite interesting for me personally in the process of doing it to, to realise that I'm not so kind of deliberate and logical as I thought when it comes to these kind of things. So, yeah, it's, it's very much personal as well. And um, I have friends who died when we were teenagers uh, who exist now on Facebook memorial groups. Um, and, of course, they died before Facebook. So I've also found that very interesting to see them exist on a service that is designed for living people um, only after their deaths. So, yeah, I've always traced it quite personally as well and, and been very interested in how it comes across there. And, and you've had experience in palliative care in yeah. Romania. Can you tell us a little bit about that? You explained some of the social context, which is your question earlier, about death in Romania and specifically in hospice. Yeah, so um, I worked in uh, hospice is a very, very um, English model of care that has been transported to a greater or lesser extent across to various countries across the world. But the hospice in Romania that I worked in was set up and managed by an English organisation. So it effectively was an English hospice, but working in a very different uh, cultural setup and also kind of legal and pharmaceutical setup. Um, it was this model that was just kind of parachuted in, which 
made it very interesting and also made it very difficult. Um, so one of the things I looked at when I was there was the idea of social death and this idea that when you're removed from your um, usual networks, it's, it's a form of death in itself. And this was very acute in the hospice in Romania because um, nobody trusted this, uh, this institution that people would go into and never come out of again, um, which is very sensible. Um, and so people wouldn't visit patients in a hospice, in the hospice in Romania, in the same way that you would accept visiting a dying patient in the hospital. So it occupied a very particular and very interesting kind of social niche, where, whereas you died when you went into hospice rather than uh, when you actually died, even though your care was better or likely better in hospice and you wouldn't have these aggressive treatments that, medically speaking, generally make you die faster. So you'd be alive longer in the hospice setting, but you'd die much, much sooner socially. So on a slightly different note, I was paging through your project or collaboration website and I saw, Stefan, a picture of you a on a crucifix, uh, which was um, slightly modified so that your hand could hold a phone and presumably take a selfie. Can you tell us about that? Uh, yeah, it's in, oh, um, yeah. This, uh, we made uh, for this first symposium that we held in um, in April on the Good Friday. Um, we started the symposium, so we together with the uh, artist, a friend of us, Selby Hildemacher. Uh, we had this idea that we wanted to have um, a selfie cross as an abstraction of the human body. It's a symbol of death. It has certain other um, references, but um, we thought it would maybe. It was just. It started more as a fun thing that we would think. Okay, the perfect angle of taking a selfie is this 45 degrees, 35 degrees up, and then you might be nailed to the cross. And it's called the Immortal Nexus Rex Instagram short. Just yeah, hashtag Inri. Um, and the idea is that people would just climb on it and get crucified, take their selfies, and then upload it immediately to Instagram and um, um, become a bit immortal for themselves. Um, that, that's basically the idea. We had a workshop of this as well, and um, where we <laughs> we had 666 hashtags that we would uh, that are related to because it was it was not really the intention to be blasphemic, but I think it's also not personally always a wrong part to do it. it um, so we collected a lot of uh, hashtags um, related to Easter and Good Friday, and but also the other things I just mentioned. So and then we wanted to. Um, to have to create these weird communities and to break in into a bit uh, with, with our selfies. And the idea is that you should take one selfie, but also actually you need the second person that takes the picture of you taking the selfie. Because this, a selfie stick would be the next thing. You need an extra extension that you really see the cross with your selfie. Or oh, I have two short arms, but there, there is still some development in this. Any other questions? You had a question over here. Paddy? Sorry, I had a question about collective memory. Um, because the thing about collective memory is that it's collective, and it sounds straightforward. But one of the things of the internet is that, you know, people are creating their own social bubbles, you know, like in the past you had, you know, newspaper, radio, TV, um, a limited amount of, of, of canals for information that sort of everybody in a whole community, like a nation, um, are sharing in and like 9-11 and, and MH17 are sort of two of the few things that sort of concern everyone but um, uh, increasingly people do not really share any of the interpretation of the information that shapes their memory so um, in what way can we actually still talk about collective memory or is it really disappearing rather on the internet? On, on the internet you mean? Oh, and just in general like do, do, do people have um, collective memory in, 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 in the same way, or is it really, um, like, does it need to be redefined, the idea that, that, that we think about collective memory as a way that um, large communities... Yeah, that is the thing I'm working on, too, because it starts to 
become open for for everybody like earlier on it was the official memory i was describing it lied mostly in the hands of institutions mm -hmm. and museums and now we are able to all co-write on this collective memory um, do we experience in the same way um, well, it, it is different because we are able to mediate these images right now. Uh, that, that is a difference uh, with how it uh, happened earlier before. But do we experience, I think we still need this togetherness, that we are still in need of this group identity, that we're still craving for it, and especially on networks. Uh, they seem to, it seems to be feeding off on each other constantly. People are spreading it. I don't know if this answers your question. Uh, yeah, a bit. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a yeah, continuing it's a research. I don't. I can't tell you right now if we experience it as 40 years ago or something. No. Okay. So, are there any other questions? Thanks. Um, I think it's interesting that uh, all of you have showed uh, somehow a slight graduation uh, or, or, or gradient in, in how these change, things have been changing for the past few years. And um, I keep looking at the title of the film of Annie Berman uh, that we'll see uh, later, um, which is completely shot in Second Life. So I was just thinking about this idea of social platforms also kind of becoming obsolete, uh, which is actually also the, the, the idea of um, uh, her film, but also what you've been showing uh, the GeoCities websites. Um, I was wondering if you, in all of your research, or anybody has ideas, um, has anything fundamentally changed in how we might virtually visit um, things, or uh, let's say places or people or uh, symbolics uh, that are dear to us? Do you feel that in these gradients, in the past few years, has anything really fundamentally changed, or is it just whatever... Um, whatever aesthetics or, or scripts or codes allow us. To Boris, do you want to no, respond to that? Um, how we might visit? Um, maybe I just need two more minutes to, to, to construct the, yeah. so, 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 It's a bit of a so long question also. Mm -hmm. I think the fact that services still exist that are something that you specifically visit means that there hasn't been that great a change. There's still not that many circumstances in which you carry on on a social network in a way that echoes how you're alive in a social network. So you still have this point of death and you still have the before and after. So fundamentally that's quite similar. Things like the, um, is it dead social, with uh, kind of algorithm generated content based on what you would have done when you were alive and like Joan Rivers. Um, means that's to me the beginning of the switch that you that you don't mark the death that you carry on and whether it's commercial or whether it's personal or anything like that to me that's where the switch is going to come that content keeps on being created and or keeps on being delivered if not created even before well the same way before or after the death of the person but so long as you keep on visiting a virtual graveyard or a specific website or a memorialized profile page, then to me, the, the, the meaning of death is still the same. And do you think the idea of a virtual cemetery has some merit? In that it echoes a physical cemetery but doesn't require people to be in a specific physical place, then yeah, I think so. But whether people will keep on getting satisfaction from that, I think is a bigger question. Okay, one more question. You have 30 seconds. <laughs> um, maybe mostly for Patti. Uh, um, I'm curious about the commer commercialization of uh, this comm commemoration uh, websites. Like, uh, I can imagine you have Schoolbank.nl, uh, a uh, website in the Netherlands where you can find old schoolmates. Have you, do you do, doing your research, um, or what do you expect? Will this be commercialized uh, and um, sites offering um, commemoration templates for occasions like smaller or bigger tragedies? 
Well, I haven't stumbled upon something like that, but if there is, I There's will. A Sorry? There's a market for you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, uh, next to official institutions, like non-official institutions are uh, commemorating already and uh, are becoming like, yeah, sort of little companies almost. Uh, uh, I saw this man who was uh, commemorating the, the war, uh, I think the forgotten war they call it, the war in Korea. Uh, yes, yes. And he had this whole thing, a whole website, a whole community built around it. It, it was gigantic and it wasn't, it wasn't pretty, uh, but he had it for like, I don't know, 10 years right now or something. So, and it, it grew bigger and bigger and bigger. And also this uh, uh, other website was also more commercially looking, also from the forgotten uh, uh, war from North Korea. So yeah, I think that the networks give uh, uh, people and small companies more power. There is no, there is no control anymore, they try to. They want this. This is why uh, uh, there are collaborations between official and vernacular memory, because I'm and I am looking into the motivation behind this. So I think that maybe uh, more towards uh, your subject, there probably will. Uh, well, there are actually sites who offer templates to commemorate. So to answer your question, yes, I think there will be in the future, but there aren't right now. Okay, I think that's a good point to end it on. Thank you for your questions, and thank you again for your um, insightful talks tonight.